Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good evening, everyone. As you know, this is our last meeting before we set off on our annual week-long hiking trip. So tonight I'll be telling you everything you'll need to know to be ready for the trip. Let's talk about equipment first. Having the right equipment is essential for your comfort and safety. First, you'll need a warm and comfortable sleeping bag. However, you won't need to worry about carrying a tent, since we'll be sleeping in shelters along the way. Also, part of the fee you've paid for the trip goes toward food, so you won't need to put that on your packing list either. We found, though, that it's more efficient for each person to bring his or her own dishes, so be sure to pack a plastic bowl, a cup, and a fork, knife, and spoon. That's all you'll need in the way of dishes. Perhaps the most important item to put on your list is a comfortable pair of hiking boots. Nothing ruins a hike more than getting blisters and sores from ill-fitting boots. So make sure your boots fit you right. Shoes and sneakers aren't adequate for the type of hiking we'll be doing. Of course, a backpack is necessary for carrying your equipment. Make sure you have one that's lightweight and comfortable to carry. Walking poles have become popular among hikers recently, but we don't recommend them. They can get in the way when too many hikers are using them at once, and some serious injuries have been caused. So it's best to leave those at home. Uh, let's see... What else? Oh, yes. Some people have asked me about trail maps. They're available, but you really don't need them, as your hike leaders have scouted out the trail and will be guiding you along the way. And don't forget to bring a warm jacket. You may think you won't need one in this warm summer weather, but remember that evenings in the mountains can get quite cold. Is there anything else I need to tell you? Oh, yes, your guides will each be carrying a first aid kit, so that's one less thing for you to pack yourself. Remember, you'll be carrying your backpack all day, so keep your load light and don't overpack. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. I know you're all experienced hikers, but it's always worth repeating the rules of the trail since they're so important. These rules are in place for the safety of everyone on the trip. As you know, there'll be a hike leader walking at the head of the line who will show the group the way. At the end of the line will be the rear leader, or sweep. It's important to always stay ahead of this person while we're on the trail. There are several different trails on the mountain where we'll be hiking, and they cross each other at some points. When you come to any intersection of trails, stop and wait for the rest of the group to catch up. This way we can be sure that no one goes off on the wrong trail. Let me emphasize here how important it is to stay on the trail. We'll be climbing through some steep and rocky areas. Don't be tempted to go off on your own and try to climb some rocks. That can be quite dangerous. Also, it's not likely, but it is possible that we'll encounter some large wild animals along the way. The last thing you want to do is try to feed any of them. That will just encourage them to follow us, which could lead to some dangerous situations. One last thing before we set off hiking each morning. Be sure to fill up your water bottle. This is perhaps the most important safety rule. Dehydration can be a serious problem when you're out in the wilderness, so you must always be sure to carry an adequate supply of water with you. I think that covers just about everything. Uh, are there any questions? Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Now, Mark and Anna, I have to say that I thoroughly enjoyed your joint presentation on the application of robotics in a non-industrial setting to the group on the 2nd of December, 
and it is clear that you have both devoted quite a lot of time and effort to it. Have you had a chance to fill in the self-evaluation form for the session? Yeah, we have. So, Mark, what do you think overall? Well, generally I felt the presentation worked very well. In fact, we seemed to hold the attention of the others throughout. And the pace of delivery was fairly even, as were the range of activities we organised. I agree with Mark, but I'm not sure we were comprehensive or academic enough. No comment, really. Except that I don't think there was any question of it not being thorough. I think we were a bit too chatty and too jokey at times, rather than formal. OK, what do you think were the best areas? And which do you think can be improved on? Well, everything could have been improved on. I felt very good about the handouts. We'd spent a lot of time putting them together. They had a very professional appearance as we bound them into a booklet. To me, the handouts were the best part, as we had a very extensive bibliography and the booklet seemed to go down well. The booklet you did for the handout certainly showed you had done a lot of work. But I think that you put too much material into it and people got distracted by it. Perhaps you could have cut the handouts by about a third. I see. When I come to think about it, maybe you're right. OK. But there were times in the middle of the presentation where things did go a bit astray. I think that was my fault when I got the PowerPoint slides out of sequence and I had difficulty getting back on track. Mm. I also think we rated our technical ability too highly, especially when operating under pressure. I had never done a presentation with technical equipment before, so it was a steep learning curve for me in particular. Yes, I think you could have done with a bit more practice with the equipment beforehand. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. What about the next item on the feedback form? The aims and objectives? I think they were very focused and we followed them through well, I think. We wanted to show how Europe was lagging behind other areas of the world. Yeah, I think they were clearly set out. Yes, agreed. No comment there. The diagrams and charts were appropriate. Yes, I have put that too. They did work well in helping to illustrate and break up the presentation by cutting down on the number of words and text on the screen. What about delivery? Well, I think our performance was average. It was difficult to coordinate speaking and presenting the material at the same time. I was quite self-conscious of what I was doing. It was down to a lack of experience. Unfortunately, both of you had the habit of standing in front of the projector, so you kept blocking the image on the screen. To me, this is the area that requires the most improvement. The section on the predictions of the commercial application in the future, I think, appeared a bit haphazard. Uh, to me, it was a weak point of the presentation. And I think that some of the slides could have had fewer words. And we could have done some fancy graphics with the words. If you had to give yourselves a mark overall, how much would you give out of ten? Six, maybe. I'd be happy with that, though bits were probably nearer a seven, so I'd say a six. Anna, what do you think? I think for me it's perhaps a seven. OK. Did you find the task and the evaluation useful? Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Good morning, everyone. Well, I think we can start straight away by getting Rose and Mike to do their presentation. Would you like to start, Rose? Yes, well, um, we've done a survey on local entertainment. Basically, we try to find out how students feel about the entertainment in the town and how much they use it. Yes, so we've called our project Out and About. Yes, that's a good title, Out and About. We wanted to find out how well students use the entertainment facilities in town, whether they go to see the latest plays, films, that kind of thing. 
Now we have our own facilities on campus, of course. Yes, we deliberately omitted those, as we really wanted to examine outside entertainment in the town. Actually, there were a lot of areas to choose from, but in the end, we limited ourselves to looking at three general categories: cinema, theater, and music. Right. Okay. Well, first of all, cinema. In the town, there are three main places where you can see films. There's the new multi-screen complex cinema, the old park cinema, and the late night Odeon. So, if you look at this chart, in terms of audience size, the multi-screen complex accounts for seventy-five percent of all cinema seats. The park cinema accounts for twenty percent of seats, and the late night Odeon has just five percent of seats. As you probably know, the complex and the park show all the latest films. While the late night Odeon cinema tends to show cult films, so when we interviewed the students, we thought the complex would be the most popular choice. But surprisingly, it was the late night Odeon. Yeah, and most students said that if they wanted to see a new film, they waited for it to show at the old park because the complex is more expensive and further out of town, so you have to pay more to get there as well. Yes, and that adds to the cost, of course, and detracts the popularity. Evidently. Well, next we looked at theaters. The results here were interesting because, as you know, there's a theater on campus which is popular, but there's also the stage theater in town, which is very old and architecturally beautiful, and there's the large modern theater. The Ash Top has recently been built. So you just looked at the two theaters in town. Yes. What was interesting is that there are periods during the year when students seem to go to the theater, and periods when they go to the cinema. And we really think that's to do with budget. If you look at this graph, you can see that there's a peak around November and December when they go to the theater more, and then a period in April and May when neither is particularly popular, and the theater viewing seems to fall off virtually, while the cinema becomes quite popular in June and July. Hmm. I think you're probably right about your conclusion. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Well, lastly, we looked at music, and this time we were really investigating the sort of. Small music clubs that offer things like folk or specialize in local bands, so not musicals as such.、And、that's right. We looked at three small music venues and we examined the quality of the entertainment and venue and gave a ranking for these: a cross, meaning that the quality was poor; a tick, meaning it was okay; and two ticks for excellent. First of all, the blues club, which obviously specializes in blues music. This was a pretty small place, and the seating was minimal, so we didn't give that a very good rating. No, we don't recommend that one really. Then the Sunrise, which plays a lot of South American music, was a big place, very lively, good performers, so two ticks for that one. The Pier Hotel is a folk venue, a good place for local and up-and-coming folk artists to play. Not the best of venues, as it's in a basement and a bit dark. But the quality of the entertainment was reasonable, and the lighting was very warm, so we felt it deserved an average rating. Finally, there's the Bald Rock Cafe, which features big rock bands and is pretty popular with students, and we enjoyed ourselves there as well. So total marks for that one. And then, did you get any information from the students as to which of the clubs they preferred? Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good afternoon. I'm Jenny Ironbridge, and today I'm going to be continuing my series of talks on information technology by looking at an innovative information source available on the internet. I'm sure you're all familiar with the strengths and weaknesses of the popular search engines like Google or Yahoo. Sometimes you can find what you're looking for instantly. At other times, searching for something which may or may not exist 
can be a frustrating and time-consuming experience. So, where can you go to get the information you want? The information source I want to talk about is called Wikipedia. As its name suggests, it's a form of encyclopedia. It's already the largest information source in history, both in terms of its breadth and its depth. But what makes Wikipedia really unique is that it's a democratic project. The content is completely free to access, and it's written entirely by unpaid volunteers. Changes and additions are being made all the time to articles which exist already, but it's also possible to contribute whole new articles. And basically, anyone can contribute, once they've grasped the basics of editing the pages. Let's look at how someone goes about editing Wikipedia articles. It's a very straightforward procedure, which has been made deliberately easy so that people who have contributions to make are not discouraged from participating because of their limited understanding of information technology. Let's start by imagining that we are reading an article and we come across information that we consider to be incorrect or incomplete on a page of Wikipedia. First of all, we decide we'd like to change it. To do this, we click on the Edit button at the top of the page. This takes us to another page with a text box containing all the editable text on that page. It's at this point that we can input our changes in exactly the same way as we would if we were writing or editing a document we had created on our own computer. In other words, we can type, cut and paste, delete, and use all the normal word processing functions. When this has been done, and we've finished editing, we are then asked to summarise the changes we've made. This doesn't go into the main text box, but into a separate area below it. That's the main part of the process over with, but we need to make sure that the changes we've made are going to appear as we want them. A last check, if you like. In order to do this, we select the Preview option. If we're still not satisfied, we have the option of returning to the Edit stage and working through the same procedure again. Finally, if we're satisfied with the result, we simply click on Save and our changes will take immediate effect. A question that might already be forming in your mind if you are not familiar with Wikipedia is this. How can I tell whether information is accurate? This particular point has led to criticism from some people, especially academics and professionals. The short answer is that you can't tell. But if you think about it, how can you check the accuracy of information you read in a conventional encyclopedia, or in a newspaper, or on other internet websites? Besides, it's possible for contributors to Wikipedia to register with the organisation and, as named contributors, gradually build up a reputation for themselves as reliable sources of information. The other point to be aware of is that there are administrators who monitor contributions that are added by anonymous sources and check for biased, out-of-date or incorrect information. One of the problems that arises from the openness of Wikipedia is that vandals have got into the site to change and damage pages of information. So the administrators have a role in policing this too. Lastly, Wikipedia encourages editors to stick to certain rules which help ensure the quality of entries. For example, contributors are expected to maintain a neutral tone in their writing, although perhaps it's impossible to be completely neutral. Also, entries are not allowed to include original research, which is intended to prevent contributors from simply submitting their own views. It's unlikely that the more conventional information sources will ever be completely replaced by Wikipedia or similar projects which may be developed in the future. But this is an ambitious experiment to democratise information, using modern technology to enable anyone and everyone to contribute to and access a common body of knowledge. And because it's free, it doesn't restrict access to those with the ability to pay.